one of my favorite uh, scripture of all time is John chapter 3, verse 16. We just heard in the gospel today. And yet, so it's for God so loved the world that he gave his only son, that all those who believe in him might not perish, but might have eternal life. So good. But Jesus doesn't stop there. Jesus, from there, goes on to this next truth. And that, that's the truth, right? The, the deep truth is that God loves the world. And that if we give our lives to him, live our lives for him, that we might not perish, but we can have eternal life. But Jesus then says, the verdict is this. The light came into the world, but people preferred darkness to light. And there's something about that that we just have to, have to acknowledge. Now, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think, <laughs> let's jump into today. I don't think that it's bad people necessarily who prefer darkness to light. I think it's ordinary people. What we've been talking about this whole Lent is about how God can take ordinary people and make them saints, but most of us are just ordinary people. And ordinary people, it's remarkable, not only can God take ordinary people and make them saints, but also ordinary people can stay in the darkness. It's not just evil people, right? It's not just bad people or good people. It's ordinary people that God, by his grace, can make saints, but it's also ordinary people that can say no to God's grace. And again, not because we're choosing to be evil, but sometimes we just feel so powerless. I don't know if you've ever had this experience of just, okay, yep, here's the offer. The offer of God's grace is right in front of me. Here's Jesus who says, God so loved the world. Believe in me, receive me, like take that next step. And yet we feel so powerless. We look at our, our past, and so often we can be owned by our past. We look at our present circumstances and realize, I'm, I am powerless in the face of my past that owns me. I'm powerless in the face of these circumstances that I cannot control. And so what do I do then? How do I step out of the darkness into light? How do I actually allow God's grace to change me? St. Paul says in the second reading today, by grace you have been saved through faith. This is God's gift. It's not anything I've done, but I feel so trapped. I feel so powerless. Once again, I'm owned by my past and I'm powerless to change my present. This is the situation that, if we're following, you know, Father Walter Chizek in this book, He Leadeth Me, this is the situation he found himself in, right? The, last week, we talked about the fact that here he is, he, got, he was brought in front of his interrogator, and he signed all the papers, right? He signed everything saying, basically, I disavow my faith, I disavow my church, I disavow my country, and then he was left alone. Well, that was after the first year, and then what happens is the next four years, he, was, he remained in solitary, and he was continued to be interrogated. But he goes back to his cell, right, and he's broken. He's, in his own words, I was nowhere, nowhere near the man I thought I would be. Why? I am now powerless in the face of the present situation, and I am now owned by my past. In fact, he said it like this. He said, I get back, he got back there, and he said, I felt sick at heart. Yes, he had this big moment of revelation, right, realization that he had God's grace, but also all I have right now is I'm owned by my past and I'm powerless in the face of my present circumstances. He says, I felt sick at heart because I knew that every step I took along this path would just make it that much more difficult and dangerous to refuse in the end to cooperate. And he said, lie once and innocence is lost forever. Fall once and the vessel is broken. Perhaps it can be mended and be made serviceable again, but it can never again be as good as new. And that's how he saw himself. Here he is in that solitary confinement cell he, he has disavowed, again, he has rejected, he's denied Jesus when it mattered. He denied his church, he denied his country, he denied his very self. And so lie once, innocence is lost forever. Fall once and the vessel is broken. Sure, maybe it can be repaired, but listen, here's the reality. The reality is you're now owned by your past and you are powerless to change your present circumstances. And he was afraid. In fact, he realized I'm owned by my past and I'm powerless in my present. And he said, I, I knew I failed. He goes on to say, he said, I was tremendously afraid having failed once. I was literally terrified that I might fail completely this time and lose the last thing I still clung to, my faith in God. And he was trapped. So here's the question. What does God expect? Like of ordinary people, of people who, like you and I, who we have, lied once and innocence is lost forever. We have fallen once and the vessel is now broken. What does God expect of us who are owned by our past and are powerless in the face of our circumstances? We can't change anything. 
Like literally, truly, none of us can go back in the past and undo what we've done. And so often we find ourselves in a present circumstances where it's like, yep, yep, this is, I'm getting what I deserve in some ways, right? Sometimes I'm not. <laughs> sometimes it's just here's a circumstance that is just bigger than me. I didn't choose this. I didn't make this. It was just given to me. And sometimes we find ourselves in a circumstance, a present of our own making, and I can't change it. So again, what does God expect? Father Chizek said, every time I found myself, he, he, so again, he was interrogated for the next four years. And every time there's like, well, you've already caved once. This is gonna be easy now. For the next four years, he was brought into this interrogation cell. And he said, every time I knew that I needed to make a decision, I knew I could just say stop. I knew I could just, at some point, step into the light, right? This is the verdict. Light came into the world. People, people preferred darkness to light. Father Walter, he knew that scripture. He knew his invitation. The invitation was to make a decision. He said this, he said, every time I brought myself to the brink of calling a halt to the proceedings, of taking some firm stand. Again, remember, this is the man who trained himself to be brave. He tra trained himself to be courageous. He trained himself to be a saint. But I faced again that awful moment of decision and of weakness, and finally of indecision. I could not do it. And I knew that every time I approached that decision and failed to make it, the harder it would be to ultimately make the decision. I think so many of us ordinary people, right, where we find ourselves trapped in this place of indecision, where I'm owned by my past and I'm powerless to change my present. So Father Walter, he knew the true truths we talked about last week, the two truths that he, he knew the depth of his brokenness, the depth of his need, and he also knew the depth of God's love for him. And yet at the same time, it was too much for him. What does God expect of a person? When it's just too much, it's already broken. What more could I possibly do? Yes, Jesus, I know that the Father sent you into this world to save the world, not to condemn it. But I don't have the strength to move forward. I don't have the strength to make the decision I know I need to do. And here's the thing, I think for today, I think a lot of us, maybe all of us, but most, probably most of us, we may be facing a decision that we're unwilling to make. We might be facing a decision that, like, yep, this is something I, I, I'm keeping away from the Lord. This is a decision that I'm just holding back. And it might not be like I'm refusing to let go of a sin. It might not be something like I'm refusing to, to, to make a big step in my life. It could even simply be the fact that I am allowing myself to be owned by my past. I'm allowing myself to be owned and controlled and powerless in the face of a present that I can't change. So what does God expect of you? Father Walter could say, what, can I, what does God expect of me? I can't, I can't change my circumstances. I can't fight the Soviet system. And he got so broken that at one point he became, he fell, fell into despair. He thought, at, he thought that the, his apostasy essentially was, was the worst. He said, but one day the blackness closed in around me completely. Perhaps it was brought on by exhaustion, but I reached the point of despair. I was overwhelmed by the hopelessness of my situation. And I knew that I was approaching the end of my ability to postpone a decision, and I couldn't see any way out of it. He said, I don't know how to say this in words. I had been broken before, but now I was afraid of myself. I knew that I had failed before, but this was the ultimate failure. This was despair. And for that one moment of blackness, I had lost not only hope, but the last shreds of my faith in God. I had stood alone in a void and had not even thought of or recalled the one thing that had been my constant guide, my only source of consolation in all of this. He said, I lost the sight of God. And this is, this is our temptation. If we stay in the darkness too long, this is the reality. You can know the depths of your need. You can know the, of your brokenness. You can know the truth, the depths of God's love for you. But unless we are willing to make that decision, our temptation is, I've, I've stayed in the darkness so long, I forgot that there's actually light. This is every one of our temptations. And it's what's going to happen if we, in indecision, continue to be owned by our past or powerless in the face of our present circumstances. And that's one of the reasons why so often in the Bible, like all, again and again in the Bible, the one word God says to his people, the one word the prophets of God say to the people, the one of the, word, one of the words that scripture says to the people is remember. Why? Because we're so, we're, we're like sieves, right? We're like leaky cauldrons. We're, we're, we're the kind of, we just forget. And so God says, just remember, 
Why? Because in the darkness, it's easy to forget. And if I remain in that darkness of indecision, what happens is I forget that there's such a thing as light. I forget there's such a thing as God. Here's Father Walter, Father Walter. He says, I lost my sight of God. And so what did you do? Now, what would you do? What would I do? In this kind of situation, we might just fail. We might just sit there in the darkness, like Jesus describes. But God's grace is more powerful than our weakness. And Father Walter, in that moment, he says, recognize, he recognizes, I recognize I lost sight of God. I recognize that I did the one thing scripture told me not to do, that I forgot God. He said, I turned immediately to prayer in fear and trembling. Basically, he realized, he recognized again the weakness in himself. And he said, I knew I had to seek immediately the God who I'd forgotten. I had to ask in that moment of despair that that moment of despair had not made me unworthy of his help. And this is, again, that temptation. If Satan is going to do anything for all those of us who are sitting in darkness, we forget the light of God and we have not made the decision or we look at our past, we're owned by it, our present circumstances, and we feel powerless in front of them, that one of the last ditch efforts of the evil one is to convince us that we're unworthy of his help. So I had to pray that he would never again let me fail to remember him and trust him. And I pleaded my helplessness to face the future without him. I told him that my own abilities were now bankrupt and he was my only hope. This is a moment of surrender for, for Father Walter that, that has, has to happen to us many, many times. And this is the key. This is one of the reasons why God can take an ordinary person and make him into a saint. Or it's also the reason why some of us ordinary people can remain in darkness. In that moment of crying out to the Lord, Father Walter said he had this image of Jesus praying in the Garden of Gethsemane. Not like a vision. It was just him remembering, remembering that in his moment of agony, Jesus cried out to his Father. He said, Father, if it's possible, let this chalice pass from me. And he re realized, he said, wait, Jesus, my God, he too knew the feeling of fear and weakness in his human nature as he faced suffering and death. Not once, but three times, he asked to have his ordeal removed or somehow modified. Yet each time, he concluded with an act of total abandonment and submission to his father's will. And Father Walter realized this big thing. He said, it was not just conformity to the will of God. It was total self-surrender. A stripping away of all human fears, of all doubts about his own abilities to withstand the passion of every last shred of self, including self-doubt. Without grace, we just have self-reliance. And without grace, we have self-condemnation. Because ultimately, none of us are strong enough. And so we run into this self-doubt. And yet here's Father Walter who realized, wait a second, if I remember God's grace, if I remember the light, I can step out of the darkness into the light and forget myself and just remember him. And that erases all tr traces of self, including self-doubt, including self-condemnation. Father Walter says this is the moment that changed his entire life. If there's an apex to the story, it is this moment. Again, and where did it happen? It happened in solitary confinement, where for a total of five years, he knew, he knew vir virtually nothing but his own weakness and God's grace. He knew nothing but his own woundedness and God's mercy. He knew nothing but his own sinfulness and his inability to, to be a hero and of God's choosing of him. He goes on to say, in that if my moment of despair had been a moment of total blackness, then this experience was a blinding light. I knew immediately what I must do, what I would do, and somehow I knew that I would do it. I knew that I must abandon myself entirely to the will of the Father and live from now on in the spirit of self-abandonment to God. And I did it. He said, I could only describe this experience as a sense of letting go, of giving over my last effort or even any will to guide the reins of my own life. It's all too simply said, yet that one decision affected every subsequent moment of my life. I have to call it a conversion. What does God expect of us? When we're owned by our past and we're powerless to change anything about our circumstances, what does God expect of us? Well, there's this Jewish man. His name was Viktor Frankl. Viktor Frankl was in a, in a German concentration camp, a, a Nazi concentration camp, whereas Father Walter was in a Soviet gulag. But in that concentration camp, Viktor Frankl recognized. He said, 
they can strip you away of every, every, every freedom. They can take your freedom of movement, they can take your freedom of speech, they can take your freedom of, of when you sleep or when you eat. They can take away almost every one of your human freedoms. He said this, everything can, be t everything can be taken from a man, but one thing, the last of the human freedoms, to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances, to choose one's own way. What does God expect of us? To use even the very last of our freedoms to remain free. I'm, you, I'm not owned by my past. You are not owned by your past. You are not a slave and powerless in your present circumstances. In fact, Father Chizik said this. He said, God does not ask the impossible of any man. He was not asking any more of me, really, than he asks of everyone, Christ, each Christian, each day of his life. He was only asking that I learn to see these sufferings, these people around me, these circumstances in the prison, as sent from his hand and ordained by his providence. He was telling me, to do something as another Christ, to forget about self and stop feeling sorry for myself, to forget about my powerlessness, and to look instead to the immediate needs of those around me and to look to him. We might feel owned by our past. We might feel powerless to change our circumstances, but we are never truly powerless. And with God's grace, we're never truly owned by our past. Father Chizek said, lie once and innocence is lost. Fall once and the vessel is broken. In Japan, there is a long history of incredible art. Some of that art involves pottery. And many years ago, there's this new art of pottery that was invented in Japan. Because what would happen is, again, here's these, these vessels, these bowls, these dishes that were just gorgeous and perfect the way they were. And then what would happen is they would get dropped, they would fall, they would get broken. And so now they're just trash. Just like Father Chizek said, fall once the vessel's broken, it might be repaired, but it'll never be as good as new. Until they invented this technique to repair this broken pottery, where they would take a mixture of silver or a mixture of gold and when they stitched together that pottery, the design that was formed in it, the veins of gold and of silver that would run through the pottery didn't just make it as good as new. They made it better than new. It's the Japanese art of kintsugi. And just like Father Chizek said, fall once, the vessel's broken and can never be restored. It can never be as good as new. That's true. Kintsugi doesn't make the vessel as good as new. It makes it better than new. And this is God's grace. This is what Father Chizek discovered. That in his complete abandonment to the Father's will, and in his surrender and saying, okay, this is what he wants for me. In his trust, what he realized is that, right, innocence cannot be restored. That life cannot just be given back. Grace does more than that. Grace heals and then strengthens. Grace heals and then perfects. Grace makes whole again and then makes stronger than it never possibly could be. And so when he allowed this truth, this truth of surrender, God, whatever your will is, he said, I filled with this, this, this new spirit and transformed interiorly. I no longer dreaded the next interview with the interrogator. Remember how we said last week that as they led him down the hallway, he could not stop shaking because he was so filled with fear. But they brought him before the interrogator and he had this sense of peace. Whatever they would ask me, that's what God wanted. Whatever the situation was, that's what God wanted. I saw every moment as a gift from his hand because he was transformed by trust, because he was transformed by grace. And so the interrogator realized this and said, well, how about this? How about uh, you become a chaplain? He's like, sure. Okay, well, how about you, come, you become a, a KGB, essentially a KGB spy in the Vatican? He's like, whatever. <laughs> and then he said, okay, well, Here's the thing, I want you to agree to working with us and being a spy, spy, spying for us against the Vatican and sign this paper. And this is the moment. Remember that Father Walter had been pray, praying before when he had to sign the papers before. He's like, God, you promised. You promised that you would give me the words. You said, when they lead you before governors and magistrates, don't worry about what you're going to say beforehand. I will give you the words to say in that moment that will confound your enemies. 
And he prayed the whole time, God, give me the words. And God had given him the words, but he said he was too afraid to speak them. Because they weren't the words that God was giving. They were the words Father Walter wanted to say. But in this moment, as he's presented with this paper to sign, saying, I'll be a KGB spy, God gave him the words. And the word was one word. He simply said no. I was asked to do this thing that I knew would violate what God is asking of me. No, I'm not owned by my past. I'm not powerless in my present circumstances. And he said, suddenly it seemed the only thing to do. And I did it. After, after years, five years of indecision, and you might have a lifetime of indecision, of staying in the darkness and being invited into the light. I knew it the right thing to do. And I did it. He became violently angry, he said, and threatened me with immediate execution. And I felt no fear at all. I think I smiled. It was then that I knew I had won. This is what Jesus wants for you. This is the last thing. This is what Jesus wants for you. And God wants for all of, all of us. He, he, he wants to give us the greatest grace, which is that knowledge of ourselves, that I'm more broken than I ever possibly, possibly could, could, could imagine. And I am, and you are, more loved and chosen than you could ever possibly hope. But to act on this, to step out of the darkness into the light. He said, when they called the guards to take me away, I thought it was going to be executed. And I simply saw them as ministers of grace. Why? Because he had finally taken that step out of the darkness and into the light. A step of grace, a step of truth. And this is the step that every one of us is invited to take. To trust in God. The truth is, you are not owned by your past. The truth is, you are not powerless in your present circumstance. The truth is, you have been restored by grace. Innocence is not lost forever. Brokenness is not permanent. With God's grace, you've been transformed and made into something entirely new.